Message from the Senate, Madam Speaker. I hereby announce that the Senate has concurred in and adopted the report of the Conference Committee on Senate File Number 2744. The Senate has repassed said bill in accordance with the recommendation report of the Conference Committee. Message is signed Thomas S. Bodern, Secretary of the Senate. Conference Committee report on Senate File Number 2744, an act relating to commerce. The report is addressed to the Honorable Bobby Joe Champion, President of the Senate, the Honorable Melissa Hortman, Speaker of the House. We, the undersigned conferees for Senate File Number 2744, report that we've agreed upon the items in dispute and recommended as follows. The report is signed by two of the three members on the part of the Senate and two of the three members on the part of the House. Stevenson moves that the report of the Conference Committee on Senate File Number 2744 be adopted and that the bill be repassed as amended by the Conference Committee. I recognize the maker of the motion, the member for Minoka, Representative Stevenson, to explain the report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, members. I am uh, pleased and honored to bring before you today the conference report on uh, the budget for the Department of uh, Commerce. This is a phenomenal bill that we can all be very proud of. It achieves things that have been long sought by people in this body and outside these walls. And I am excited that they will finally become law. Uh, we talked yesterday at some length about the word transformative and whether that is a good thing or a bad thing. But I am here to tell you that some things are in need of transformation. And this bill accomplishes that. We should all be able to agree that the way that we access prescription drugs in this country is in need of transformation. People should not be choosing between paying the mortgage and paying for the drugs they need to live or rationing the health care that they need and dying because of it. And this bill takes us in a great step towards changing that practice. It includes Mike Howard's excellent bill to cap the co-pays that people pay for the drugs they need like insulin and EpiPens, the things that we all hear when we're out talking to our constituents. It includes a ban on price gouging of generic drugs. It includes the strongest prescription drug affordability board in the country that will make meaningful change to bring down the costs of drugs that people need to live and that a few enormous uh, pharmaceutical companies are milking for every dollar that they can get. Uh, it includes uh, protections on mental health, the crisis that is gripping our country that is talked not enough uh, about in this body, uh, including bills to recognize collaborative care and, and psychiatric treatment facilities, but also uh, a bill that uh, Representative Cagle has worked on for years to create a mental health parity uh, accountability office in the Department of Commerce. Because what good is it to have a law that protects mental health access if we don't enforce it? We need to enforce it, and that's what this bill uh, will do. Uh, it also uh, will make sure that the hard-won gains that we have around access to preventative services are preserved no matter what ideological extremist judges in other parts of the country rule. Uh, we had a judge uh, in another state rule uh, unconstitutional, the federal protection about preventative uh, care. We're going to enshrine that in Minnesota law so that Texas judges can't stop Minnesotans from having access to PrEP and PEP and cancer screenings and all of the other preventative care uh, that uh, they deserve uh, to have. Uh, there's also a suite of consumer protection provisions uh, in this bill. We are going to join the vast majority of states that adhere to the simple idea that if uh, a company is engaged in unfair practices, we should be able to do something about that. Uh, we are going to end uh, the extreme abuses of the payday loan industry. Again, thanks to the work of Representative Cagle and Representative Katiza uh, Watoon. Uh, this has been something that people have spent over a decade doing. It is getting done in this bill. Uh, we are going to pass a right to repair uh, so that people have the opportunity to fix of their own things. And that's a special one uh, for me. I had a constituent uh, that I met when I was out door knocking the, the first time I ran. Uh, and he had uh, glioblastoma. Uh, it's the same cancer that killed John McCain and, and Ted Kennedy and, and thousands of other uh, Americans uh, every year. And he called me and told me that this was the bill he really wanted to see uh, passed. Um, he died two or three years ago. I'm glad that we finally are getting it done. And I'm remembering him uh, today. It includes. Um, uh, Rep. Representative Hemmingson-Yeager's excellent bill on genetic testing. She told me that we'll be the seventh state 
uh, to protect people's genetic data. That's pretty good. I like that. Uh, it includes, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, it includes uh, your bill uh, to get rid of uh, minimum markups in uh, gasoline, uh, ending that eight cent markup uh, that uh, isn't doing anyone good uh, as a consumer uh, basis. Uh, I wish we could have done even more. And uh, maybe that's why our terms are two years, because we'll come back next year. We'll take on big tech. We'll take on big pharma. We'll take on all sorts of other things. But this is a good start. Is there any other discussion on the motion to adopt the conference committee report on Senate file 2744? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to adopt the conference committee report on Senate file 2744, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. no. The motion prevails. The clerk will give the bill its third reading as amended by conference. Third reading, Senate file number 2744 as amended by conference. Third reading is amended by conference. Discussion to Senate file 2744, it's repassage as amended by conference. I recognize the member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that any Republicans voted for this bill coming out of this chamber the first time, and I can't imagine that anyone will this time either. Um, there are really significant problems with this bill that just haven't been fixed, and I'm going to highlight a few of those for you. Um, I, I will start by just saying, you know, just uh, this is something that, you know, I've had private conversations with my Democrat colleagues and friends. Um, unfortunately, while I, I believe the goals of this bill are good, and I believe the intention is to decrease the cost of health care, to decrease the cost of prescription drugs. I believe that that is uh, the goal. I believe that's the intention. I just think evidence shows us that that's not the case, that that's not what this bill will do. Um, you know, let's, let's address capping copays. I've used the example you know, we, the, this bill caps co-pays for just a few select chronic illnesses, asthma, diabetes, um, allergies, I believe, an EpiPen maybe, I forget what the third one is. Um, here's the problem though. There are a lot of people who just don't need those caps. And frankly, most insurance companies have already done those things, particularly when it comes to diabetes. Um, but there are a lot of people who don't need this benefit. I use the example of, of my brother-in-law and sister-in-law. She is diabetic. He is a radiologist. I assure you they're doing fine and can afford to pay for her diabetes supplies and her insulin. They can pay for it. And here's the problem, when we do these sweeping reforms that say nobody should have to pay for this, what we mean is that everyone should have to pay for this. Because by capping these costs here, somebody has to pay for that. The cost still exists. And so now we're gonna say that that cost is going to be picked up by other people even for those people who can afford it. And I'm a real fan, actually, of picking up those costs for people who can't afford it. We should do that. That is a proper function of government, in my opinion. We should be caring those for those who cannot care for themselves. It's the same thing. We had this discussion with the school, school lunch program, right? I thought, you know, let's, let's up the limit. Let's make sure, let's make sure there is no question that kids who are struggling, families who are struggling, have that resource and that they have those meals in school. But frankly, I'm not wealthy, but my kids don't need it. My kids didn't need it. But now everyone in the state is going to pay for me and my kids. It's unnecessary and it is expensive unnecessarily expensive. And the same thing on this, on this prescription drug affordability board, I, it, it kind of blows my mind. 
as I, as I gave a litany of reasons and problems with this prescription, prescription drug affordability board, we were basically just told, well, I don't know where you get that information. And I told you, we get it from the chairman of the PDAB in another state who has told us, the chairman of the PDAB who has said publicly, has said publicly that the, that the cost from the manufacturer has indeed gone down, but the cost to the consumer has gone up. That's not my data, that's not my information, I'm not making that up. That is coming from the person who is running the Prescription Drug Affordability Board. But somehow Minnesota is magic. And here, we're gonna make sure that we're actually lowering costs for the consumer, which presumably is who we care about. It's who we should care about, but we're not doing that. To follow this theme, this bill very dangerously removes all of the funding from uh, the account that pays for the Minnesota reinsurance program. To give you a little history to go back, after Obamacare was put in place, as it turns out, contrary to once again the goals, which, and I believe the goals were good, the goals were to lower the cost of health care in the United States. But unfortunately, in the state of Minnesota, they did the opposite. And after Obamacare was implemented, costs skyrocketed all across the state of Minnesota. And in fact, it was such a problem that insurance carriers were pulling out of certain markets. It was too expensive to even be in the market. And so, as the you know, as, as the pull, our, pull ourselves up by the bootstraps Minnesotans that we are, we went to work and figured out how to help people. And we did that through reinsurance and it has been extraordinarily successful. We did not just stabilize the insurance market, we actually lowered the cost of health insurance by 30%. 30%, as someone who um, has had to buy our family's health insurance on the individual market, it's expensive, it is. And to think that we could actually lower costs by 30% is extraordinary. Now, a couple of years ago, you re may remember we had a significant debate in this body about reinsurance. And finally, our Democrat counterparts um, came to a uh, negotiated agreement where they changed, they changed the program. They kept it, they said, okay, we'll do reinsurance, but it's not gonna be as, as effective as it was before. And immediately, immediately with those changes, insurance rates shot up again, immediately. And so the next year, interestingly, the Democrats got smart going into the election year. And the next year, they came back and said, yeah, we better fix this. Let's, let's bring these insurance rates down again. And so they did. And they went back to the original parameters of reinsurance and dropped those costs again. This is an extraordinarily effective program. It is a proven program. It's a program that Senator Amy Klobuchar has advocated for at the national level to fix the problem. And yet, Democrats in Minnesota are putting that at risk again. With an, with an almost $18 billion budget surplus, you are, you are scrounging up the change from every couch cushion you can find and then you're charging Minnesotans another $10 billion more in taxes and fees because somehow it's not enough for you. And we're gonna pillage the reinsurance fund. We're gonna pillage the reinsurance fund and put that program at risk again because there is never enough money for you. There's never enough. So we're gonna put reinsurance at risk, allowing those health insurance rates for Minnesota families to skyrocket again, to put them back on this roller coaster 
of are the Democrats going to be willing this year to give us some relief or are they not? Well, clearly this year, the answer is no. We're going to pillage that fund and put it at risk for the future. Let's talk about mandates. <laughs> Although the mandates in this bill are, are interesting. They're a little unique. The mandates in this bill fall under the category of mandates for thee, but not for me. What we're doing in this bill, and, and you know, those of us who have served on the Commerce Committee, on health committees, we know the trick. We know how this works. What happens is that Democrats bring forward bills to make these radical changes to the health system, but then they exempt CGIP. They exempt the state programs. And here's the deal. They do that because when they don't exempt the state programs, there is a massive fiscal note because it's expensive. It's really expensive. So when you put these mandates on insurance companies, the state has to pick up that tab too. The state is picking up the tab for our Medicaid, our Medicaid folks in the state who, are, who need that service. The state of Minnesota is on the hook for Minnesota care for low income people. And it's also on the hook for what we call CGIP. It's our, it's our state insurance plan. These are state employees. Frankly, it's what we as legislators receive. We are on the CGIP insurance program along with all of our other state employees. So when you put these mandates, in fact, it's always, this is actually, this is your, your trick, this is your clue. If you see mandates being placed on insurance companies, but the state programs are exempted from those mandates, 100% of the time, state programs are exempted because it's going to cost a lot of money. We are raising the cost of health care with these mandates. We are raising the cost of health care in the state of Minnesota with these mandates. Every Minnesotan on a private insurance plan is going to pay more for their insurance. And it's not because they're getting more. But they're going to pay more. And again, you know that the, the, the tell, every time the tell is if state programs are exempted. And they are. State programs are exempted. That means, and, and again, with an $18 billion budget surplus, they still, it was, these mandates are going to be so expensive that $18 billion is not enough. $18 billion. Actually, it's not even 18. We should start calling it 28, I suppose. 28, 30 billion dollars. It's not enough. With the surplus and the new taxes and fees, $30 billion is not enough for the state programs to live with the same mandates that we are placing on private insurers. $30 billion. What's the percentage that we're increasing the state budget overall? 40, 40%. 43%. 43%. A 43% increase in our state budget. It's 50 some billion now. It's going up to well over $70 billion. $72 billion. A 40, uh, guys, I don't know if you can wrap your brain around that. A 40% increase in our state budget. $18 billion budget surplus, $10 billion in new taxes and fees, with an additional $30 billion. We can't come up with the fund funding for this bill. It's still, these mandates are so onerous that we've got to exempt all of the state programs. That tells you one thing, it's expensive. It's very expensive. I talked a little bit about this Prescription Drug Affordability Board. And of course, like I said, the name suggests 
It's going to help Minnesotans afford their prescriptions. And the name suggests, and I, and I believe the intent, the, the, the intent is that it's going to save Minnesotans, individuals. It's going to save me, my family, your families, your moms, your dads, your grandmas, your grandpas. It is going to save them money when they go to the pharmacy and pick up their prescription. That's the intent. That's the intention of this bill. I like that intention. That should be all of our intention. To lower the cost of prescription drugs, that is 100% what we want. That is 100% what we want. Everyone's on board. But when we're setting up this board in a way that we know right off the bat is not going to work, because, you know, I, I don't know what we keep hearing this year, but there's advocates. There's advocates that want it. We hear that on every single bill, these mythical advocates that want things. We don't always know who those advocates are. We certainly know, we certainly know that on this particular issue, all they're doing, in fact, this is a habit, we like to cut and paste language, cut and paste legislation from other states. That's what this does. We're taking this price, price, prescription drug affordability board that we've seen, uh, it's passed into law in several states. We have not seen it decrease the cost of medication in a single one of them, not one, not one. But instead of waiting and seeing, okay, what are the problems? Minnesota's like, nope, sign me up. Sign me up, let's get this done. Maybe we should wait. Maybe, maybe it would make sense to say, it's, it's the beauty of the United States, right? It's the beauty of a republic. That we have all of these different states who are trying different things. Maybe it would be smart at some point if Minnesota Democrats thought, you know, there are some states doing this. We should see how this works out. We should see how this works out for them. Because you know what? I mean, it's like, it's like technology, right? Any first generation technology. I don't know about you guys. I'm not very good with technology. And so I always have to wait. I cannot, I cannot buy first generation technology because I can't be the person that they're going to work out the bugs on. Because frankly, I just, I, technology is too frustrating for me. So I can't, I can't be the person they're going to work out the bugs on. And here we have a situation with the PDAB that we have a number of states who are already doing this. And instead of waiting for them to work out the bugs, instead of looking to the states that say, you know what, it, it, we're going after the big bad uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers, we're going after the big bad drug companies, we're doing that. And you know what, other states have found that that is effective. You, the PDAB has effectively lowered the cost of pre prescription drugs coming from the manufacturer. It has been successful in other states on that front. But the problem is this is a really simplistic view of a very complex problem. The drug manufacturer is one piece of this supply chain. They are one member, they are one cog in this wheel. Just one. You've got, you've got this, the entire supply chain. The PBMs, you've got the, the end user, you've got the pharmacies, you've got hospitals, you've got specialty pharmacies. There are a lot of people in this supply chain, but this T PDAB goes after just one of them. The PDAB goes after manufacturers. So like I said, in other states, they have found, yes, this is effectively lowering the cost from the manufacturer. But it is raising costs. Costs have gone up for the consumer, for the end user. 
And I don't think that's what we want to do. I don't know why we would barrel through and say, let's do it. Let's take that language and plop it here into Minnesota. Let, this, let these experiments play out so that we can fix them and we can do them right and we can actually lower costs of prescription drugs from the Minnesotans who need it because there are people who need it. There are people who desperately need it. And I get it. I get it. I've talked about this a lot. With my late husband, he was on a significant cocktail of drugs, mostly treating symptoms, but a significant cocktail of drugs. And just one of those medications, it was a nebulizer treatment, just one of those medications was 600 bucks a month. Out of pocket, that was my cost. It was 600 bucks a month. I get it, it's expensive. Minnesotans need those costs lowered. But frankly, I could care less if we're sticking it to the manufacturer and you're sticking it to me. I could care less. Let me correct that. I could not care less if you are sticking it to the manufacturers. But then my neighbors still have to pay even more at the pharmacy. That defeats the purpose. Why are we doing things that other, again, this is the chairman of the PDAB, the chairman of the Prescription Drug Affordability Board. This is a direct quote from the chairman. This is not some rando person. This is not some anti-pharmaceutical company person. This is, this is somebody who presumably wants to see these costs lowered the chairman of the Prescription Drug Affordability Board has said that yes, this, this has been successful in lowering the cost from the manufacturer, but at the same time, it has increased costs for the consumer. The person at the pharmacy counter is paying more. But we're just going to do it. We're just going to do it. There's a provision in this bill regard, regarding price gouging, which again, all of these things sound really good. All of, every one of these provisions sounds good, and, and at its face, we're all on board. We should ensure that, that we are not putting Minnesotans in a position, particularly at the most critical times, where they are being taken advantage of. That's a big deal. And so there's legislation in this bill to ban price gouging, and it is well intended. Again, I agree. But once again, it fails to deliver that value to customers, to the consumers, to every Minnesotan who needs that relief. And in fact, this is sort of shocking. Instead of protecting consumer, it just gives more power to the governor because that's what we need, more power to the governor because we've seen how well that works. It's going to lead to lawsuits. In fact, I, I asked Representative Niska, we need to put together an actual list and accounting of all the lawsuits that we expect to come out of this legislative session, because it's a, it's a doozy. That's going to be quite a list of all the lawsuits that we expect to come out of this legislation, legislative session. And this is just another one. 
We are inviting lawsuits, giving more power to the governor, more power to the executive branch of government, and we're not actually helping consumers. It's gonna cost the taxpayers more money without a gain, without actually controlling prices or improving supplies. So it's been, it's been a habit. This, and in fact, it's not, it's not just this bill, it's not just right now in the chamber, but we have this habit of spending a lot of time just fawning over, again, preening and peacocking about how amazing this bill is and all the good it's gonna do when we just know it's not. The Democrats already tried to gut reinsurance a couple of year, years ago and very quickly backpedaled on that and said, ooh, it's an election year. We better bring that back. We better bring those prices back down. We better make sure that health insurance is more affordable. I'm sure all these mandates on, on insurance companies are just top shelf, really good. But guess what? If they were actually going to save people money, it would apply to public programs. If it was actually going to lower the cost of health care, they would apply to public programs. But it doesn't. Mandates for thee, but not for me. And ironically, when we say that, when I say mandates for thee, but not for me, I say mandates for all of you, the rest of the Minnesotans out there, but not for me, not for my plan as a legislator. These mandates don't apply to my plan as a legislator. They're not gonna make my costs go up. They're not gonna make my costs go up. But they are gonna make your costs go up for every employer-based insurance plan in this state. That's how this works. That's how this works. When state programs are exempted, it's because it's expensive. It's because we can't afford the fiscal note. That's how this works. Folks, this is gonna be an expensive bill for Minnesotans. It's gonna be an expensive bill with very little gain. We're not getting much for it. And in fact, in your day-to-day -day life, you're not gonna get really anything for it. You're not gonna know that this commerce bill has passed into law. In your day-to-day -day life, this is gonna have zero impact. There's a lot of bills actually that, there's things that we do here that have an immediate positive impact on your life. And those are the things that we should do. Those are the things that we should be focusing on as legislators. This bill isn't it. This bill isn't gonna have a, an impact on your day-to-day -day life. You're not even gonna know. But you might know in your pocketbook. At a time when between a, a surplus and taxes, we've got $30 billion to work with the state of Minnesota and the government. At a time we are passing a budget that is 40% bigger than the previous budget, you're gonna feel this in your pocketbook. You are going to feel this when you're doing your monthly budget at home. When you're writing your checks and paying your bills, you are going to feel the effects of this bill. But I suppose you can have the moral victory of knowing that, hey, those drug insurance companies, or those drug manufacturers, we're sticking it to them, but oh, shoot, you're also sticking it to me. Sorry, Minnesotans, that's what you're getting from this bill. Further discussion on the repassage of the conference committee report for Senate file 2744. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Nadeau. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would Chair Stevenson yield to a question? Chair Stevenson will yield to a question, Representative Nadeau. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Chair Stevenson, if you would look at uh, line number 61.12. 
Um, this is talking about standard plans. I don't recall this bill being heard, at least it didn't, wasn't heard in health. And if I'm not mistaken, this is just putting a federal requirement into state, into state law where we already have this option regard, regarding standard plans. But could you just speak to that and tell me if that's what that's doing and what problem we're solving by adding that into the bill? I recognize the member for Minoka, Representative Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Nadeau. The sections related to the standardization of plans come from the governor's uh, budget uh, uh, proposal, uh, and you are correct that it is uh, reorganizing existing law and applying federal law to Minnesota. It's <laughs> you are correct, Representative Nadeau. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I wish I was more dramatic, um, and I could I could speak, you know, a little bit uh, a little bit louder and m more like my friend Representative New Brindley on this bill. There, but I'm not. That's not who I am. There's a, you know, there are some good things in this bill. Um, there really are. Um, you know, I'm glad to see that Representative Freiberg worked with uh, worked with um, you know all parties on the infusion clinical administrator drugs um, component of this. I, I think he made some good headway. I like the the headway that um, Representative Bierman made with um, you know some of the uh, reimbursement benefit reimbursements delivered through the collaborative care model. I I think there's some good things in here, but there's also some really tough things in here and. Representative New Brindley, you know, really hit it on hit it on the head. And we're talking about the the, the prescription drug avail, uh, affordability board. We we had this debate. I'm not going to rehash it. These are these are unproven um, policies that we're putting in place. That hopefully, I I'm I'm hopeful that that uh, Chair Stevenson is right. Um, the first time I heard the bill, I asked. Bring me through the sequence of events. How does this deliver lower cost to consumers? And we're still waiting to hear that. Um, this bill is a lot of, there's, there, it's, it's bigger government, it's more government. I, I, I recognize that, that that side of the aisle, you know, really believes that government can play a more important role in driving down those costs. Um, in healthcare, it just doesn't happen that way. I wish we'd have had the debate on the health bill before this came up. I think it would have been easier for me, um, I think it would have been a lot easier for me uh, to do it. We have this body, and especially this bill, once again, it focuses on one half of the component of healthcare delivery, and it's access. It's access. We have bent over backwards, spent multiple millions, hundreds of millions of dollars creating more access for more people to get care, which is great. There's nobody over here that doesn't believe in that. But the other half is affordability. And I get it that we, it, it's, it's written in here, the words in here, but the people that actually have the ability to help deliver affordable care are basically saying, this is not how we do this. And those are the partners that I, when I mentioned Representative Freiburg, Representative Bierman, you know, they're listening to, the, to those, to those bodies, to those people, to those communities um, that are saying, we've got we've to change this. So th there's a lot in here. Representative uh, New Brindley is, is, is absolutely right. There's not one thing in here that's going to drive down consumer costs on, dr on, on prescription drugs to consumers. There's nothing. It is the most, I wish we would have started maybe with rebates. If we would have started with drug rebates, I think we could have actually, you know, done something. But we didn't start there. And so with that, I'm sorry. I, this bill is not, I, I get it, it's going to pass. I, I, I wish it weren't. I wish we'd think harder about these things. Um, but I'm a no vote on this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the discussion on the repassage of the conference committee report for Senate file 2744, I recognize the member from Carver, Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, if you remember when we <clears throat> had this bill on the floor here uh, during the hell week that we had, I, I mentioned the, the digital repair, and I, I likened it to the TV show, uh, The Andy Griffith Show. And uh, I don't know if, how many of you remember who I, I referenced as the character, but it was Emmett Clark the guy with a fix-it shop on Main Street, Mayberry, who you would bring your toaster to or maybe your blender, 
Uh, you might bring other small, maybe your TV back in the day. And I think those are the things that make sense when we talk about being able to repair them. And uh, Representative Fisher doesn't seem to be on the floor, but I, I will give him credit for listening and trying to help uh, bring some changes to the bill that would sort of mollify some of the, the concerns of the manufacturers of technolo technological equipment. But I wanted to point out something that the chair said in his introduction that he was, he was hoping to uh, either in this bill or one day hold big tech accountable. Um, what happens in this bill is manufacturers of machines that, uh, Representative Bliss, you might know a little bit about this uh, in your IT days, we don't necessarily want to hand over the, the, the full keys of the kingdom on certain types of equipment because when you, when you do that, you make it easier for bad actors to compromise things. And that's costly, dangerous, expensive, and some of the practical upshots of those things are uh, if a person who is uh, intending to repair some piece of enterprise technology gets access to certain things, they know how to defeat them. They, you could do things like you could defeat uh, grids, electrical grids, you could defeat um, certain systems at hospitals or schools or security systems at any of these places. And there's a reason that large technology manufacturers try to keep things close to the vest because it's one, proprietary information, but two, when you again hand these things over to people who are not certified technologists, they are, they, some could literally be hanging out a shingle uh, outside of their garage or their mom or dad's garage. Uh, they are not properly trained. And the manufacturer doesn't have control over what's going on when they are handed uh, this, perhaps, a, a, an enterprise piece of technology. That's concerning. We have brought that again and again and again to people, and I think that the, the concerns are really quite, quite pronounced. Um, you've all had letters, I think I passed out last time, uh, a, a letter of concern from Cisco. I know that there are many technology manufacturers who are quite concerned with this bill. The concern should also transport to you because this is your bill, this is your decision. You're likely to be the only side to put up votes for this. I don't believe anybody from our side is going to do so. But let's make it even closer to home. Um, one of the many hospitals that you may uh, have in your area could be compromised with technology that you're going to forcibly hand over to people who may purport to be uh, interested in repairing things, but they may themselves be bad actors trying to get access to things that they can then compromise and take down a system. So that's on you. So many of the many of the hospitals that we talked about um, with Representative Brandt's bill a little while ago, um, or actually it was Representative Bierman, sorry, Representative Brown, um, you know, that are they're going to be seeing many many challenges. You're now going to make it perhaps even more expensive for them used to serve on the hospital board. I know that technology investments are significant, but if you immediately hand over some of the, the access to what they're trying to protect their systems with to who knows who, uh, you're going to put them in a very uncomfortable position. You're going to wind up having to have uh, greater and more security contracts go out there. I, I think that it's certainly a nice idea to want to be Emmett in Mayberry RFD. Certainly we'd love for someone to be able to fix their toaster or their lawnmower or whatever, but when you get to the level of enterprise tech, and I think I shared this story um, during the debate. So there's a well-known company in China called Huawei, and they will actually buy enterprise technology here in the US from one of the other vendors and they'll ship it over to China and they will very quickly copy it and take pieces and parts out of it and they have been caught doing so. Uh, but because they are effectively the Chinese government's technology company, the Chinese don't care. But we are now going to make it even easier for them. They won't even necessarily have to break open a machine. You're going to require that they be given all the specs, tech, and keys to the kingdom. 
that should deeply concern all of you. But by the fact that no one over there is listening to me, you're all looking at your phones and, and such, I can tell that you don't care. And that's even more concerning. Because when some of this eventually forensically leads back to compromises as a result of this change, then you'll care. Then you're going to care and you'll say, well, self, that was a bad idea. That was a really awful idea. You know, so many of us have people in our lives that depend on technology being in place. Here's an example for you. The 911 system, both what it's based on now and what it will become, is predicated on having a fixed latitude and longitude being able to be pushed back to first responders. We'll have a little nerd moment here. Currently, it is based on what's called a tiger file. It's a topographically integrated, geographically encoded record. That means the piece of tech will have to be able to interface with a latitude and longitude and then direct EMS service to you or police service to you. But if you then hand over the keys of the kingdom, and this is not a prop since it's my phone, but if you hand over the keys of the kingdom to a, a, an iPhone or other phones, you're now going to make it even easier to potentially compromise that. And if we were to see a great deal of bad actors try to take that down and then not be able to respond to emergencies, uh, well, none of our EMS people are here, but you could have a call, and so I'll just pick on Representative Quam since he's looking at me. Someone picks up the, the phone at Representative Quam's house, dials 911, and they get sent to Representative Mueller's house. They're not even close. That's the sort of practical upshot that you all are making even easier in the passage of this bill. Once again, this is not a toaster. And you all may have believed all the propaganda you've been given that this is a great bill, this is a transformational bill, this is lovely, everyone's going to love this. It will change your life. Yes, it could change your life for the worse when you hand over proprietary tech kind of at gunpoint. You're making them turn this over. That's troublesome. I will not be affixing my green vote to this bill. I encourage members to not also affix a green vote to this bill. Vote red on this bill. This is not a toaster. Thank you. Further discussion. I recognize the member from Olmstead, Representative Hicks. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. I am so excited to push the green button for this bill today. Um, some people in this chamber know, not everybody, my youngest daughter has a rare health condition called mast cell activation syndrome. Uh, she had her first anaphylaxis reaction when she was 11 months old. Since then, she has subsequently had 24 anaphylaxis reactions. She's been in pediatric ICU, hooked up to epinephrine, which I've been told is not typical nor great medical practice, but it was the only thing to keep her on the planet. I buy EpiPens in packs of six. She's a rebounder, so when she reacts, we're gonna need two, maybe three, depends on how long it takes us to get to the hospital. We don't vacation anywhere that's not three hours close to a PICU, because after she has three, we have heart issues, so we need to be somewhere where they can intubate her. This is the life of an allergy parent. And when I had commercial employer insurance through my nonprofit, which was a great company to work for and they gave us the best insurance they could, I stood at pharmacy counters where people said, that will be $500, please, to keep a one-year-old on the planet. We weren't rich, we didn't have $500. That was, back then, half our mortgage. This bill, changes that. This bill ensures that children who are allergic to bee stings and dairy and nuts and strawberries and watermelon can go out into the world and their parents don't have to worry that they will die because they couldn't afford their EpiPen. So today, for all the allergy moms, I say thank you. We appreciate it and it is life-changing for us. Further discussion on repassage of Senate File 2744 is amended by conference. I recognize the member from Isanti, Representative Dowd. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker and, and members. Um, appreciate the opportunity to talk about the Commerce uh, Omnibus Bill. Uh, we had a good discussion when it left the floor. The bill is not much different. I'm, I'm actually uh, fairly disappointed in that. Um, I think there were some things that, that really needed to be fixed and, and changed in that bill. Um, and I think we just missed the mark on that. A uh, couple of those that I want to talk about, uh, number one is the reinsurance uh, provision. Um, reinsurance has been a, a, an incredibly successful uh, uh, product here in the state of Minnesota um, and, and has helped keep the uh, rates stable in the individual marketplace. As you might remember, um, the, the disastrous implementation of Obamacare here in Minnesota and the, and the disaster that it was for Minnesotans with the, um, you know, uh, skyrocketing uh, deductibles and, and uh, you know, basically, you know, technically I think you could say that there are more people insured, but uh, by no measure of um, any metric that we actually track would you actually, with a straight face, say that more people are insured? There's, there's far less people that have reasonable, affordable coverage in this state as a result of Obamacare. Um, for years, we were seeing uh, uh, increasing premiums uh, in the individual marketplace that were hurting Minnesota families. We heard many stories of people who, uh, you know, had a, th you know, family of four. I remember a one particular family that I've actually gotten to know quite well since then. I didn't know them at the time at all. We just stumbled across them at a at a um, little town hall meeting that we did down in uh, Red Wing, I think. Um, and this was a family of four. And I actually heard this story repeated multiple times since. Uh, very similar um, stories by families who were seeing the same kind of increases. Uh, but this particular family, as a result of Obamacare, uh, saw that they're, and they were a, f a small family farm, um, family of four, uh, they were paying uh, $13,000 for their deductible before they ever got one penny of coverage, and their premium was about, th gosh, if I remember right, 3800 a month or 3600 a month, something like that. Um, I mean, we're talking $50,000 out of pocket before you have one, you know, with the premiums and the deductible, before you have one penny of coverage for your family. I mean, that's the disaster that Obamacare was, is, and, and has been here in the state of Minnesota uh, for Minnesotans. Um, it's really been disastrous. By every stretch of, or, or metric that we would measure here uh, in the state, it's really been disastrous for Minnesotans. And the reason for that is simple. Um, in Minnesota, we actually did it better than all the other states. So when, when you set a, a, a mean bar across the, the country and say, okay, we want the level of, of, of health insurance and health coverage to be here, when you're above that bar, you end up coming down, and, and that's what happened. So uh, what we should have done was we should have exported what we had here in Minnesota to Washington, D.C., instead of taking those bad ideas and bringing them here. Um, well, we won the majority back in 2014, and, and one of the, the things that we implemented was a reinsurance program. And the reason it was needed is because uh, we saw those premiums just every year uh, when it came time to bid uh, in that individual marketplace, the low bidder from the previous year would always drop out completely. They would just leave the individual marketplace. So every year, there was one less provider. Um, and then the next year, the low bidder would provide uh, coverage for one year, and then they would drop out the next year. They wouldn't even provide coverage in the individual marketplace. So, um, and then every year the premiums would go up. And I, I can't remember the numbers now, but I want to say we were seeing like 30 and 40 and 50 percent increases each year in those uh, those premiums. Just absolutely unsustainable and absolutely unaffordable. Um, and and the evidence of that really uh, was um, that that our hospitals. Um, you know, they use, a, I think commonly on this house floor, we use another term, which I don't like, so I'm not even going to say it. Uh, but the, the more technical term that the hospitals would use is uncompensated care. So um, in uncompensated care, uh, that's basically people who receive services but don't pay their bill. Um, and after Obamacare was implemented here in Minnesota, the level of uncompensated care was actually higher after it was implemented. And which seems kind of shocking, right? Because you know, technically we could say that more people were insured under Obamacare, but the reality was because they had a $13,000 deductible now instead of a $1,000 deductible, they couldn't afford to pay their deductible. 
so they couldn't pay their bill at the hospital. And, and so hospitals actually had a higher level of uncompensated care um, after Obamacare came to the state because of those high deductibles. Um, so they were not, people were not able to pay their bills. And, and, and in essence, I would say those people then were not insured. Um, so what we did uh, because of those kind of skyrocketing um, premiums uh, as a result of Obamacare and uh, the fact that we had an insurer, that the low bidder insurer each year was leaving the marketplace, we put in place this kind of creative solution, which is actually very similar uh, to the MSHA program from our previous, uh, uh, prior to Obamacare, the way we did healthcare here in Minnesota. But basically it was a reinsurance program where um, the state would cover the, the most expensive claims so that the insurance companies could price their product and know that they weren't going to have to pay claims above a certain amount. Um, so we would take the, the really, I'm talking about the really egregious stuff, right? The, you know, cancer treatments and the, the you know, the very expensive treatments that somebody, uh, you know, might, might have. Um, and I think the problem, too, with uh, the individual marketplace after Obamacare came to Minnesota was um, that the, the number of people that were in that individual marketplace was probably... 20%, something like that. I don't remember the numbers right off the top of my head, but probably 20% of what was promised here on the House floor and what was predicted by those who were, um, you know, who were uh, advocating to implement Obamacare here in the state. So um, had we actually had those higher numbers, I think that the, the, the whole uh, program probably would have played out a lot better. But, um, you know, folks left the individual marketplace because they couldn't afford the products. They couldn't afford the, the deductible and they couldn't afford the premiums. Um, and, and so what we did is we put this reinsurance program in place um, and it became, it was so successful, it became a, a, a national model. And I think since we did it, uh, I think 12 or 13 other states have, have implemented that and, and have done it very successfully. Um, so we became a, a nation leader, which we were actually before Obamacare, but we, we once again, after the debacle and catastrophe that Ob Obamacare was, um, we, we kind of, at least in that individual marketplace, because of reinsurance, became kind of a national leader in solving one of the problems that Obamacare created. Um, so we actually, again, in, in what we should do more of is exported our good ideas to uh, other parts of the country. Don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about the ideas here in this session that we should be exporting. Um, we should not wish that uh, on anyone in this country. Um, but prior, um, you know, I think we've got a good example that we can talk about in this bill. So uh, we went through about five years, I think, of, of reinsurance. It was very successful. Um, we actually saw an actual reduction in premiums of, I think the number is 36%. So, so uh, premiums came down more than one third uh, just as a result of that. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's the sort of success that we should celebrate here uh, in the state. So uh, over the last couple of years, uh, the reinsurance program was reauthorized and it was funded for, I don't remember if it was two years or three years, but, but actually that funding that we gave it because of the predictions, it actually was enough to operate the program for probably four or five years. And I think by the time we got there, um, uh, the five-year uh, operation would have been um, uh, we would have been able to operate the program for the full reauthorization for the full five years that it was reauthorized. Um, unfortunately, uh, this bill and, and this committee received a target from leadership um, that was a negative target. Um, and there was no way to reach that target. It was a negative, I don't know, I, it's probably in my paperwork here, 260 million maybe. Um, and the only way to get that money out of this bill was to take the money out of the reinsurance program that had been authorized for that program and transfer it now into the general fund to use for other things. That's what the targets and that's what this bill does. Um, we made a motion, obviously, to uh, stop that transfer and leave this money. Um, and, and the great part of, of what I get to say next is that I'm not imagining what could happen. It's not a hypothesis. Um, I'll tell you exactly what's going to happen. 
insurance premiums for Minnesotans who are in the individual marketplace as a result of this bill will go up at least 36%. We know that because that's the history. And we have enough of a track record now to know when we fund, Ob uh, when we fund the reinsurance program uh, where premiums are, and when we don't fund it, we know where they are. Um, and consistently, uh, Democrats in Minnesota have tried to defund this program. Um, and of course, because of our House rules, I can't speculate as to why they might want to do that. I think people outside this building might say or speculate that Democrats want the individual marketplace to fail. Now, I don't want anybody to, to really uh, speculate on that. Um, I don't think it's appropriate for us to do that. But I, but I think that this bill could give people the idea that Democrats want the individual marketplace to collapse on itself so that they could put in place a, uh, a single payer. Um, lately, they've, I love, I love how the language changes, right? And we, we try to find words that sound really great. Um, what they call it now is the public option. Um, the, the problem with the public option is there's no private option. It just becomes a single payer system. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually use the term single payer because that's what it is. And what that means is that means government run healthcare. That means government will just pay for all the procedures for everyone. Um, and we know what that means in other parts of the world. The parts of the world that have that sort of a healthcare system right now, um, they're all moving away from that. Other states that have tried to do a single payer system um, have, have I, I said this during the initial speech and I should have looked it up. It was Connecticut, Massachusetts, somebody in the Northeast um, got into this far enough that they were gonna put in place a single payer system until they saw the numbers. Um, in, in the legislature, we call that seeing the fiscal note on what something like this is gonna cost. And, and they got far enough into it that they saw the, the fiscal note and the fiscal cost and they realized, whoa, we better back out of this because there's absolutely no way that we could ever afford to do this. Um, and, and the problem is uh, you take away all of the incentives that are created by a free marketplace. And, and I, wanna say, I wanna say that and use those words because that's important consistently across the board to what Democrats are doing this session. They're removing the incentives that created by a free marketplace and what they are doing in return is incentivizing bad behavior. Um, so in the, in the uh, healthcare marketplace, what that means is you're gonna incentivize people to go to the, the doctor in the hospital for anything that they have, including a little cough or a runny nose, and that clogs up our healthcare system to the point where people that need to access healthcare can't get in for months and months on end. And then you've got the government rationing healthcare um, and deciding, you know what, you're 73 years old, you've lived a good life, we don't think you deserve a hip replacement or we don't think you deserve a knee replacement. You know what, I think I'd like to, I don't know, I'm, maybe I'll borrow a term that I've heard used in this chamber before. I actually think that's a decision that should be made between a patient and a doctor, not, a, not some government health board that decides rationing healthcare is, is, is the only thing that we can do now. Um, and, and somebody in the government gets to decide whether my uh, dad gets a, a knee or a hip replacement. Um, no thank you. I don't want the government making those decisions. So uh, we put in place uh, the uh, reinsurance program. We did that for you know, very good reasons. It has been incredibly successful by every measure. Um, and, and so it was, it was so successful that Democrats in this chamber reauthorized it uh, in the last couple of years and they funded it for three years, which ultimately would, if we leave the money in that account, it would fund it for the entire five years. Um, maybe we have to check on it in four years and just make sure there's enough money there for the fifth year, but I'm pretty sure it would actually fund it for the five years. And that's the, that's the track record of how successful this program has been. Um, and it actually, you know, premiums are still too high uh, because we still have the effects of Obamacare, but this actually did a lot to keep them uh, lower and it's been incredibly successful. So I really wanna thank Democrats um, for their past support of reinsurance and their, their past understanding of how important that program is and what it did for Minnesotans. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm disappointed that they have forgotten that already. You were the ones that reauthorized it. You were the ones that put this money in and funded it. And now uh, you're stealing money from it. And, and stealing money is, is a word we like to use around here. Uh, when somebody sees a little pot of money uh, sitting as a surplus in a fund that they realize 
you know, I could actually uh, take this and use it for something else that I want to do. Um, and, and the problem with that is it will hurt Minnesotans, period. It will raise insurance premiums for Minnesotans by at least 36%, period. Those are not in question. Those are facts. So the this, this stupidity of taking this money is only amplified or, or uh, yeah, amplified. It's, it's only amplified when you look at the current environment that we're in right now where we have a $17.5 billion surplus and greedy Democrats are going to raise another $9.5 billion in taxes. And on top of that, they have to steal $260 million from Minnesotans who are struggling to pay for their health insurance. I mean, that's the environment that we're in on this bill right now. It's just absolutely insane that in this environment where we've got a, you know, double, more than double, the biggest surplus we've ever had in state history. And on top of that, Democrats can't, you know, they're, they're outside groups asking for so much funding for every little program they've ever dreamt of and Democrats' absolute inability to say no ever to one of their special interest groups, now we've got Democrats stuck in this, you know, between a rock and a hard place where they actually have to raise taxes another nine and a half billion dollars on top of the 17 and a half billion surplus we have. Total of 27 billion dollars of resources available. And you know what we need to do? In that environment, and just so you know, our budget is what, 50, 52 billion dollars? And we've got an extra 27 billion of resources available? And what do we have to do? We have to steal 260 million dollars from Minnesotans who are struggling to pay for health insurance. I wish I was making this stuff up. Do you know what, I'm super creative. I couldn't have even thought of this. In a million years, I couldn't have thought of this. But that's where we are. And, and I hope there's just, you know, what do I need? Three members over there? Three members over there to say, you know what? Isn't this just going a little bit too far? So I'm hoping that I can persuade three members of the Democrat caucus to just say, you know what, maybe when we have $27 billion of resources on top of the base spending of 50, I don't know, spending in the current biennium I think is 52 billion. The base is already increased from that and on top of that another $27 billion of, of resources available. I mean, it's crazy town. And we got to steal 260 million, whatever the number is, 260, 270 million dollars from Minnesotans who can't afford their health insurance. We cannot do that. This is stupid. Um, and, and, you know, we talked about it before the bill went out of the House to conference committee. I was fairly convinced that folks would, would have a, some moment of clarity in conference committee and realize, you know what, maybe we're, maybe we are overtaxing Minnesotans. Um, everybody outside of this building can see that. And everybody on this side of the aisle can see that. But I actually think you guys are so stuck in a fog that you have failed to actually sit down and look at what you're doing. Just put it on a piece of paper. Put down what the base spending was last, you know, the, the current spending this biennium. Then put what the forecasted base is going to be. And then add on top of that the surplus. And then add on top of that your tax increases. And then add on top of that all these little pots of money that you're stealing from in all of these bills. It's crazy. You have no business being here if this is how you manage funds. And none of this is political. Stop trying to shove your ideology down Minnesotans' throats. Let's think back to when you were on the campaign trail and what Minnesotans were most concerned about in this state. 
the biggest things that Minnesotans care about, inflation. We have record inflation. You made promises to give them their Social Security tax, or not tax their Social Security. Let them keep it. Broken promise. The highest inflation in a lifetime. Crime rates skyrocketing, and you bring a public safety bill that's actually going to keep Minnesota, you know, make Minnesota less safe. But we're funding a whole bunch of nonprofits that, that we are not holding accountable at all. They're not doing anything, and, and frankly, there's no accountability. You don't even ask them to fill out a report to tell us what they did. You just give them money. There's no oversight of the fraud, the waste, and abuse in, in all of these programs, the feeding our future. I understand there's another huge fraud coming. I got a little tip. I don't know much more about it than it's in that uh, DHS or Health and Human Services. I think it might be in the uh, uh, home-based services, but I understand that it's a fraud that is greater than $100 million. I heard about it a month ago. And I kept thinking, any day now, any day now, any day now, if I find out that you knew about it when it comes out, or that our governor knew about it and kept it hidden from Minnesotans while you snuck your way through a legislative session, stealing $27 billion from Minnesotans in addition to you know, the money that they've already given you, I would put that at the highest level of no shame that I've ever seen. So pay attention, mark this spot, mark this day on your calendar, because I'm sure I'm not the first person around here who has told you there's another big fraud coming, north of $100 million of fraud. And I still can't believe we haven't, it hasn't totally been released yet. But I have it on a good source that there's a, there's a pretty significant fraud in addition to the fraud that we've already seen. And no accountability, no uh, holding anybody accountable from the Feeding Our Future fraud. And nothing to correct that to make sure it doesn't happen again. So, members, uh, this bill, uh, because of this reinsurance provision, absolutely cannot go out of this chamber. Um, this is the point where you need to say, you know what? Your common sense needs to take over and you need to say, no, we're not gonna do it. We're not gonna take more money. We're not gonna steal more money from Minnesotans. Um, and, and so this is your opportunity to do that. I thought we made a good case when this bill was here the first time before it went to conference committee. I thought for sure you were gonna fix some of this stuff in conference. The bill comes back, it looks almost identical to what went out of here. And I can't tell you how shocked I am because this is really bad legislation really bad public policy. Um, and that brings me to my next point in this bill, uh, which is the boat bill. You know, thankfully we live in a state with no lakes and nobody that owns a boat. So this will affect no Minnesotans, right? Oh wait, no, we have 15,000 lakes and I don't even know how many boats. Hundreds of thousands of boats in this state. And boat insurance is not required in the state of Minnesota. But we're gonna do something in this bill that hasn't been done in any other state in the country. And that's, I wish it was the first time I was saying that this session. But there's a whole bunch of groundbreaking territory uh, in these bills. And when you're doing something for the first time that nobody else has done, there's probably a reason for that. It's probably a really bad idea. And I assure you that you're not creative enough to think of things that nobody else has ever thought of. It's just that those other people had a threshold of common sense where they realized, yeah, we looked into it and realized this is just really a bad idea. Um, you know, and, and maybe it's not that big of a deal for a state like Arizona or, you know, Oklahoma. But in Minnesota, we do have 15,000 lakes in this state. Um, more, boats more boats per capita than anywhere else in the country. 
here in Minnesota. So to my point, uh, seven percent, what is the first part of that? Seven percent of registered boats in the, in the United States are here in Minnesota, and we have 809,000 registered boats. So seven percent of all the boats in the country are right here in Minnesota. Folks, that includes the, both coasts. So we've got 7% here in Minnesota, and that's 809,000 boats. Now, I'm gonna warn you, boat insurance is not required in the state of Minnesota. And that's gonna be a very, I'm saying that poignantly because it's gonna be very important as we proceed through this conversation. 809,000 boats in the state of Minnesota, and insurance on a boat is not required not even liability insurance, okay? Like it is on your automobile, right? You have to have insurance on your automobile in, and, and, and that insurance is not only to protect you, but it's to protect the other people if you're in an accident. So that if you know you're in an accident with somebody, um, you have, and I'm not an expert on insurance, but if they don't have insurance, you have insurance on your car that will cover you and then you have a, uninsured motorist provision that, that kicks in as well. Um, but insurance is required by law in the state of Minnesota. So, and it's to protect you and to protect the other people, okay? 809,000 boats, 7% of all the boats in the country right here in Minnesota. And this bill would, for the first time anywhere in this country, allow a husband to sue a wife or vice versa or a family member. And, and the reason this is so bad is because you now have two parties which have a, I think what lawyers would define as a shared financial future, who can sue each other or one can sue the other and sue their insurance company and have a shared financial future. So the person who is in court, who is supposed to, who the insurance company is defending, sleeps at night and rides to court with the person who is suing them. So how do you think those depositions are gonna go? And I'm not suggesting, and I know that we had a long conversation about this on the House floor the first time this bill went out, and we talked about the potential for fraud. I'm not suggesting that somebody is going to create a boat accident or cause one with the, with the idea of committing fraud. What I'm suggesting is that a real accident could happen or, uh, I'll, you know, I'll still call it an accident, but an accident where there is some level of... Uh, um, where the, where the person does something wrong. The driver of the boat does something wrong and they are at fault. And now you've got their spouse who can sue their spouse who was at fault for an injury or something. And those two people live in a home together, share bank accounts, share a financial future, which means that the person who was at fault benefits from the spouse suing them. There is a big reason why this isn't done anywhere in the country, because it invites fraud. And I'm not suggesting somebody's gonna create a boat accident or cause one just for the purpose of fraud. I'm suggesting that you know, an accident can happen where the spouse is actually at fault and somebody else who has a shared financial future in that family is injured. Now they can sue the spouse and both spouses benefit. So do you think that the spouse who was at fault is gonna be a, a good witness on behalf of that insurance company? Or now all of a sudden does the insurance company have two witnesses working against them? And, and could it be in their best interest to maybe cover up the fact that there was some behavior that was at fault by the, by the one spouse? And maybe they'd say, no, I wasn't speeding, or no, I wasn't drinking, or no, I wasn't, you know, doing any of those things. Um, this was just a freak accident and the insurance company should write us all a big check. Even though 
the spouse may have been drinking and the spouse may have been operating the boat in a manner that is unsafe, a reckless manner. Um, and, and now that spouse who did that can benefit by the other spouse suing them. And that's exactly the sort of fraud that this uh, bill will invite. But what are the practical implications of that? Um, the, the practical implication of this is it will undoubtedly increase insurance premiums for boats in the state of Minnesota. That is without question. It's only a matter of how much will, will, will boat premiums increase. Um, will they increase 50%, 100%? I think that's very likely. And it could be north of doubling. 100% increase would be a doubling of your, of your boat premium. I think it's very realistic to assume that, that, that's a, that that's a realistic possibility, that they, could, that they could double. Could be more than double. I think it's also very fair and very realistic to say that boat insurers, people who insure boats, will likely stop offering that product in the state of Minnesota because they won't want to. There's, there's no way to imagine how much this provision could cost them in, in, in increased losses. Okay, so they have to try to actuarially price their product and, and there's no way to predict how much that is gonna cost. So I think you will very realistically have insurers leaving the marketplace. So what does that mean? That means you've got a state that has more boats than any other state in the country. 7% of all registered boats here in Minnesota. We all love to get out on our 15,000 lakes across the state and enjoy the rich tradition of water sports in our summers here in Minnesota. We love it. And people are gonna think they're gonna be out there and be protected in case something happens. Well, certainly the operator of that boat has insurance and I will be covered and I will have access to the limits of that policy if I am injured and that driver of that boat is at fault. So what does it mean when premiums double or if insurance companies leave in a state where we don't require insurance on a boat? It means that some people will stop carrying coverage on their boat. The only requirement left might be if you have a loan on your boat and your bank says, I want to make sure that we have full coverage on the, the hull of that boat, meaning if it's damaged, our asset, which is the, the collateral on the loan that you've gotten from us, that, that asset, that collateral is protected. Okay, so that may be the only reason anybody carries boat insurance in the state of Minnesota anymore. So what this provision will do is it will increase boat premiums, likely 50 or 100%, and it will mean there will be less access to insurance coverage in the marketplace because we have less insurers in the state insuring boats. But the real problem is it means we will have less boats covered and thereby more risk for Minnesotans who are participating in our water sports in our beautiful summers here on our lakes in Minnesota. So this is a real problem. Um, I don't ever want to be the guy that says I told you so, uh, but these provisions will be catastrophic uh, to Minnesotans who are going to be out on the lakes in the summertime and some boater does something wrong and injures them and they will not have access to the limits of that, that insurance policy because that insurance policy won't exist. We will have uninsured boaters, more uninsured boaters on our lakes because of this and less protection for Minnesotans who are hurt. So you're not what, this isn't a consumer protection bill at all. This is a fraud bill. This is a bill that allows for fraud and will actually result in less protection for consumers. Okay? And I know the groups who want this bill passed. I'm not going to pick on them, but I think we all can figure out who's going to benefit uh, when, when uh, you know, 
you can have more cases in, in court and, and lawsuits between two spouses with, with potentially very high judgments. Um, I think you all know who's going to get a cut of those judgments. So uh, it's wrong, members. It's wrong. And I will tell you, I'm going to fess up and be honest with you. When this bill first was proposed here, I supported it. I was sympathetic to it. I was a supporter. And then I dug into it, and I realized, oh, wait a second. There's a, there's a very good reason why nobody in the, in the country does this. Because it's ripe for fraud. Um, and, and the real practical applications of this is this provision will also hurt Minnesotans. This, this is a bill that will remove protections from consumers in the state of Minnesota. This isn't a consumer protection bill. This will remove protections from consumers because we will have less boats insured as a result of this provision. Um, and that's not something that I could ever support uh, leaving this House chamber. So members, as you're considering your votes on this bill, uh, I've just given you two very big reasons why I think no one in this chamber can vote for this bill. No one should, and I don't think anyone can vote for this bill. Um, if you do, you are turning a blind eye to Minnesotans. On the first count, we have the reinsurance program that you literally in this bill are stealing $260 million from Minnesotans who are already struggling to pay for their health insurance. You're stealing money from them, and it will result at least, and this is factual, I'm not guessing, I'm not throwing darts at a dartboard, it, because of past history, the rates and premiums will go up at least 36% for Minnesotans in the individual marketplace. That is wrong. At a time when we have a surplus of $17.5 billion, which is actually 19 before you artificially reduced it, um, but $17.5 billion surplus, and you have to steal money and cause people's insurance premiums to go up. Shame on you, that is wrong, period. And the second reason why nobody can vote for this bill is because you are actually removing protections from consumers in this bill who participate just now. I mean, look at the beautiful weather outside. It's spring. People are just now thinking about getting out on the lakes and enjoying our summers here in Minnesota. And you, by voting for this bill, will put them at risk. You will leave them unprotected. And there will be catastrophic harm life-changing injuries done to Minnesotans, and you will remove any protection they will have uh, to, get, to get reimbursed for those, uh, those injuries, because we will have less boaters in the state of Minnesota who will have liability coverage to help in the case there's, a, there's, a, there's an unforeseen tragic accident on one of our lakes. So those are just two reasons why no one in this chamber, in a good conscience, can vote for this bill. Um, and, and so uh, for that reason, I'm sure that I've convinced more than three, because I have to assume, I have to assume that there are at least three people on the other side of the aisle with common sense. So, or you can prove me wrong. You can lockstep, follow the party bosses, right down the, right off the gangplank, and steal money from Minnesotans, raise their health insurance premiums, and put them at risk as, as they uh, enjoy our summers on our lakes here in Minnesota. Or you can prove to me that there's at least three of you that have common sense enough to say, you know what, enough is enough. At this time of the highest inflation in our lifetimes, it maybe just isn't appropriate to take this much money from Minnesotans. In a Commerce Department omnibus bill, it's maybe just not right that we pass a provision that will remove consumer protections from Minnesotans, that will result in more Minnesotans being at, at risk of, of not being compensated if they're in a tragic accident out on our lakes in our Minnesota summers. So, members, please, please show that the, the little part of my heart that still has some warmth in it, 
that believes there are at least three people on the other side of the aisle that have any shred of common sense left in their bodies. Please prove to me that that little, that little candle that's still burning in that back dark part of my heart is right. And that I sense that there are at least three of you that, that have enough common sense to vote against this bill. So members, uh, thank you for letting me share my concerns uh, about this bill and about the, cat the catastrophe that will be caused if we do pass it, about these horrific provisions uh, that we should not even be considering here in this chamber, um, especially at a time when there's so much bigger problems uh, we need to solve. So I appreciate your uh, letting me just talk about it for a little bit and, and share uh, some personal heartfelt stories uh, about folks that have in the past been, been harmed by these bad Democrat policies. Um, and, and just to try to provide you with a little uh, sense of what the future might look like if you, if you blindly pass uh, this sort of a bill uh, and it becomes law here in the state of Minnesota. So um, I'd ask all members, uh, finally, before I sit down, please vote against this. It, it is the right thing to do. Uh, please show me that a bill like this this is not partisan. Please show me that a bill like this can go out of this chamber and not be a straight party line vote. Please, you were the ones that funded reinsurance. You were the ones that reauthorized it just a year or two ago. You funded it. You put the money in there because you must have thought it needed to be there. You must have been convinced that the program was worthwhile. Please show me that you haven't changed your mind that quickly and that this isn't just an opportune pot of money that you can steal from. These are real people who have real insurance policies who will see real 36, at least 36 percent increases if you pass this bill. You will hurt Minnesotans if you pass this bill, period. Not debatable. You will hurt Minnesotans if you pass this bill. Please show me that you have some faith left in humanity. Please vote against this bill. Further discussion on the repassage of Senate File 2744 is amended by conference. I recognize the member from Anoka, Representative Niska. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. And Representative Dowd, you're completely correct. This, is, uh, this bill in its final form is really more of a stimulus to the legal industry um, than anything else. And, and I'm a lawyer, and I have friends who are lawyers, and lawyers have families to feed. Um, so I understand that, um, but that's not really what our focus should be um, in passing this, this bill. And, and of course, we are all for common sense consumer protection. And, and Chair Stevenson, I did, I did appreciate a lot of the discussions we did have um, in the Commerce Committee this year about um, really carefully trying to balance uh, some issues and looking at some things. And, and there were some uh, common sense consumer protection uh, things we looked at that I think were, uh, that had broad support. And, um, and, that, and that's our job as a legislature, as the people who make laws for the people of Minnesota. It is our job to look very closely and carefully at those issues and to try to make sure we strike the right balance on each one of those issues. Um, but I wanted to just talk specifically about one place, one particular provision here where I think we're not just failing to do that, but really abdicating our responsibility to do that in the future. And that is the unfair and unconscionable acts and practices provision. Um, and the, the main definition here is uh, on page 179, line, starting in line 22. And this ties into two other existing uh, statutes. And what it does is it creates uh, both authority for the attorney general um, under this nebulous concept of an unfair, unconscionable acts or practices, as well as creating private rights of action for enterprising plaintiff's attorneys uh, to go find things that are unfair and unconscionable acts and practices. And the definition here, the language we're using, is really very problematic, and, and we need to understand that. What we're doing is we're, instead of ourselves defining as a legislature what are consumer protection violations and what are not, we're just giving the attorney general, we're giving plaintiff's lawyers and ultimately giving the courts the, the, the power to make that, those policy decisions that should be our ultimate responsibility as the elected representatives of our, of our constituents, of the people of Minnesota. So 
I think, it, I, I think it's worth talking a little bit about this definition. It defines this concept of unfair or unconscionable acts or practices as any method of competition, act, or practice that, one, offends public policy as established by the statutes, rules, or common law of Minnesota. Now, it's very important that we look at that entire sentence. It's not violates the statutes, rules, or common law of Minnesota. It offends public policy as established by the statutes, rules, or common law of Minnesota. The violations of the statutes, rules, and common law of Minnesota, those are already against the law. So what we're doing is we're telling the, the um, attorney general, private plaintiff's lawyers, and ultimately the courts to look at the statutes, rules, and common law of Minnesota and maybe like look at the emanations from the penumbras of those things and think about what offends public policy. So that's bad. That's pretty bad. That's not good drafting. But it gets better. Two, is unethical, oppressive, or unscrupulous? Those are not words that are defined in Minnesota statute. Unethical, oppressive, or unscrupulous. I think there are a lot of things that people do that are unethical or unscrupulous that we don't ban in, under Minnesota law or is substantially injurious to consumers. So this is horrible legislative drafting. Horrible legislative drafting. And we had a hearing about this, and, and a, a, I understand this is a big priority for the Attorney General's office. If I was the Attorney General and wanted to just maximize the power in the Attorney General's office, first of all, I'd be really thankful for what we've done so far this legislative session already. But I would really want uh, a really horribly drafted bill like this to just throw open the doors for me to decide consumer protection law in the state of Minnesota to take the policy making authority away from the, the people of Minnesota. So I understand that it's a, this is a priority of the Attorney General's office, but what the Attorney General's office uh, assured us in the hearing on this, and you can go back and watch uh, the hearing, is don't worry about these horrible vague words that we're writing into statute because other jurisdictions have also used similarly vague words and their courts have, uh, have had cases where they have had to interpret those vague words, and don't worry, they've, they've, they've uh, tightened them up. But again, our job is to make the law. Our job is to balance those interests. And we did a good job on some issues in the Commerce Committee, and I hopefully, hope we will again, um, on many of these issues. Pay, you know, uh, Userous lending, uh, uh, consumer uh, disclosure, those kinds of things, antitrust. We, we deal with those issues all the time, but ultimately we are the ones who answer to the people of Minnesota. We should not be delegating our power in the way that this is doing to the Attorney General, to private plaintiff's lawyers, and to the courts to make that uh, consumer, to make uh, consumer protection law in Minnesota. So for that reason, again, this bill is really uh, a bonanza for the legal industry. It's a bonanza. It's a stimulus for, for lawyers. It's really good for plaintiff's lawyers who are going to have new opportunities to bring lawsuits, to, uh, uh, to get uh, contingent fee awards or to get fee awards under uh, all of the different causes of action we're creating with attorney's fees provisions. But it's not good for the rest of the people of Minnesota. So. If, if you're for the plaintiff's lawyers, I suggest voting yes. If you're for the people of Minnesota, I suggest voting no. Further discussion on repassage of Senate File 2744 is amended by conference. I recognize the member from Morrison, Representative Kresha. Thank you, members. And just a couple of comments on this bill. I remember when it first came through, uh, I was on the Commerce Committee. And I, I remember when the, the individuals that had prompted this through an accident and, and like the Shawshank Redemption, I remember the quote of Andy Dufresne, they had a quiet way about them. And as they came to the conference, we started to hear about this bill, and that has gone away. I remember what I realized is, in here, we've now turned this into the family protection, the consumer. And it reminds me of another famous movie, as I was thinking through this, because we have all this time, of The Princess Bride, where they say, I don't think that word means what you think it means. And so I started to think about this. This really doesn't mean that. And members, what's really funny is as the victims left the conference committee, you know who was left? It was the trial lawyers who were sitting there like Uncle Rico and Napoleon Dynamite saying, you know, if they would have just put me in, we'd have won the state. And my goodness, that's what has happened. The trial lawyers have taken this over. 
In over six years and eight years, they've worked on this bill and worked on this bill. Members, this isn't a family consumer protection bill. This is an economic development bill because there's unemployment and underemployment among the trial lawyers, and this will give them the jobs that they want. And my goodness, with every breath they take, they gotta be looking at this going, this is an opportunity for us to take this on and get more employment. And I think to my God, I think to myself, just like Taylor Swift, you're the anti-heroes. You don't need this bill. You have plenty of work to do. And so, I mean, act like dancing queens and have your fun and go ahead and jump. But this is a terrible bill, and members, vote red. Further discussion on the repassage of Senate file 2744 as amended by conference. I recognize the member from Stearns, Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I was wondering if I could uh, ask the bill author to yield to a question. I want to clarify uh, a point here, if I could. Uh, Representative O'Driscoll, it appears that the author of the bill is not in the chamber, but I believe that he is nearby, so we will go and uh, see if we can track him down and get him in here to uh, answer whether or not he'll okay. yield to your question. I'll hold on. Representative O'Driscoll. That's fine. I'll hold. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And would the bill author yield to a question? He will yield to a question, Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Stevenson, um, when we, this bill left the House floor, there was a provision in here about the Minnesota Department of Commerce doing a study on the reinsurance program and delivering that to Commerce. When we got to the conference committee, a multi-page letter was referenced to that. Commerce said they didn't feel that they were qualified, able, have the authority, et cetera, to do this. Um, could you review for the body what the, the bill now says um, the Commerce um, Committee will receive and the legislature will receive as it relates to the reinsurance um, report? I recognize the member from Minoka, Representative Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Driscoll. I, I think you may have misspoken. You said the Department of Commerce was supposed to do a study. It was EMCHA that was supposed to do the study as it came off the House floor, and EMCHA that sent the letter uh, saying that they really didn't think it was appropriate for them to do the study. They said that they don't have the statutory authority to do work like this, that they don't have the capacity to do like this. It's not their role. They objected to it on a few different grounds. Uh, I raised the issue with, with the Department of Commerce and uh, they uh, told me um, that there were places where that data that the study was looking for was already available. In fact, there had been a study done uh, by the RAND uh, Foundation uh, that uh, got at the same data. I asked uh, Commissioner Arnold to send me a, a letter to that effect. Uh, she did. I uh, transmitted that letter uh, by email earlier today uh, to represent Doubt, who was the author of the study uh, amendment so that he would have that. I'm also happy to share that with you, Representative Driscoll, if you would like it, the, the letter from Commissioner Arnold. Uh, but the study language is not in the bill as a result of that. Representative O'Driscoll. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, you are correct. And I, uh, Chair Stevenson, and that's why I wanted clarification, because that report is not in here, but there will be something forthcoming um, to, to um, the Commerce um, Committees in the House and the Senate on this. And folks, this is extremely important. Um, again, as Representative Doubt laid out the case just moments ago, reinsurance has been a, uh, a godsend, a savior for a number of small families trying to cover their health costs and their health needs here in the state of Minnesota. Prior to that, when we saw um, back in the 1990s when the Clinton administration um, took over, uh, then First Lady and uh, former Senator now Hillary Clinton spent an awful lot of time in the state of Minnesota in the first weeks of her husband's administration learning about how we do insurance here in the state of Minnesota. And the MCHA program that was referred to by the bill author, Representative Stevenson, um, was, a, was a monumental act in 1976. It was, MCHA stood for the Minnesota Comprehensive Health Insurance Act. And what it did is it said, we are going to provide insurance alternatives for people who are not able to be underwritten and meet the normal standards of underwriting. And what happened was we found a way to be able to put a safety net, a backstop, if you will, for these individuals who are rejected for health care. 
and it has worked marvelously well until Obamacare here in the state of Minnesota. What happened when Obamacare came is it caused a ripple effect of tidal waves in the insurance industry. Insurance literally became unaffordable, and those who did have it, group plans, etc., it became very expensive to be able to continue to offer that benefit and to be able to have health insurance to meet your basic health needs, let alone catastrophic losses. And so what the state of Minnesota did at that point is they went and they applied for a waiver to the Trump administration. Now, some of you probably just, what, what, Trump administration? Perks up your ears. There's more, hang with me. And they said, Minnesota, you're trying something in, kind of innovative with the reinsurance program. We're going to give you a five-year waiver on it. And not only was it successful in Minnesota, we had bipartisan congressional support in the state of Minnesota to try to nationalize that concept in insurance. Now, little known fact, and I can understand why people don't want this fact to be known, but the Trump administration and the Biden administration actually agreed on something. Let me say that again. The Trump administration and the Biden administration actually agreed on something. And that was to allow Minnesota to continue to work in this incubator by giving us another five-year extension on reinsurance in the state of Minnesota. The Biden administration saw that Minnesota was doing the right thing. And so last year, we sought reauthorization for reinsurance. We agreed to a three-year plan. And I was very involved in that because I was the deciding vote on the conference committee to be able to make sure that we had reinsurance here in the state of Minnesota. There were two DFL members who were adamantly opposed in the conference committee and two DFL members who saw the light of day and said, you know what, we need to continue to do reinsurance. And 2-2, two, two, you don't win. I was the Republican that was on there. And I cast the tie-breaking vote to be able to continue reinsurance here in the state of Minnesota. I'm ever glad I did. Because Minnesotans didn't see an interruption in their insurance coverage for health insurance. Minnesotans did not see premium increases that were in tow if the reinsurance program went away. Not only that, we stabilized the market for another three years. Then came the 2022 elections. And the first opportunity we got as a legislature with the, the new control was we were going to defund reinsurance. We're going to go into the premium security account and we're going to take money out of there. We're going to reappropriate those funds elsewhere. I was going to put that program at risk at some point in the future for Minnesotans who are the most vulnerable people. But don't worry, we're going to put the public option out there. Let me explain to you something about the public option. Minnesota care is what is being floated as the public option. When you've been around this legislature as long as I have, you tend to learn a couple things about how processes work. When there are mandates that go in for insurance coverage, you must cover this, 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 and this. It goes into the products that are offered in the private marketplace. And oftentimes in that language, there's an exception that says something like this, except for Minnesota care. This does not apply to Minnesota care. So if you were to lay two policies on the table with the price tags on those for insurance premiums, everybody's going to go, oh, I would really like the Minnesota care until they actually have to start using it to cover some of the catastrophic things or to cover some of the mandates that have found their way in over time. We heard a member earlier today talk about how her family is benefiting from some of the different mandates that are in there. She wouldn't necessarily get that for her family in Minnesota care. I haven't dug in to find out if that particular provision or allergy is covered, but I can tell you this, don't bet against it it's most likely not there. That doesn't help people in Minnesota. But not to be outdone, this bill also has a provision in here that says we're going to Obamacare 
Medicare premiums in the state of Minnesota. We're going to pull out the requirement for underwriting and Medicare. Persons 65 and older who buy a Medicare supplement will no longer need to go through underwriting. Folks, if that story sounds familiar, that's what happened with Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, which we found out was actually unaffordable. We're going to stick it to them. First couple of years, it's going to look good when you get your premiums. Oh, look, look, I found a cheaper policy. They didn't have any underwriting. Until the market begins to stabilize when it has been destabilized and pricing comes back in. I have suggested in committee, and I have suggested on this floor, and I'm going to suggest again today, that we in the state of Minnesota will be needing to look for a reinsurance program for Medicare supplements for seniors in the marketplace. And three or four years from now, we're going to be sitting in Commerce Committee and the Health Committee, and we're going to be saying things like, can you believe what the insurance companies are doing? The premiums for Medicare, Minnesota's most vulnerable, the greatest generation, won't come up with all kinds of reasons why it's the insurance company's fault for a provision that's in this conference committee report today that we all have a decision to make. My fingerprints will not be on the bill raising insurance premiums for Medicare because I am planning on voting no on this bill. We are putting Minnesotans just in this bill through the ringer. Moving from reinsurance to boat insurance. I, I, want, I, I just find the title in this, the Minnesota Family Protection Act. I think it really should be labeled the Bon Voyage Boat Coverage Act here in the state of Minnesota because insurance in auto, as Representative Dowd said, and he is correct, we are a no-fault state, so to operate your passenger vehicle on the roads in the state of Minnesota, you are required to carry liability coverage and no-faulting coverage, which would protect you and those riding in your vehicle in the case of an accident or injury, well, as the industry calls it, alighting a vehicle, riding in, operating, or alighting a vehicle. We do not have that provision in liability insurance for boat insurance. What we have done is we have wedged it open and said we're putting it in there. In a liability policy, liability is me being responsible to someone else. That's a misappropriation of insurance coverage under the very function and principles that insurance has been set out for hundreds if not thousands of years across the world. Never has anyone been liable to themselves or to an economic unit the way this is set up. And boat carriers, boat insurance companies, three or four or five years from now when they start getting these, and, and you sit down with your agent and they go, yep, it's time to talk about renewing. Oh, by the way, effective this state, we filed with the state of Minnesota to no longer offer boat coverage. You're going to have to find that somewhere else. Well, why? Well, Here's the history. And then what we're going to hear in commerce, the audacity of those insurance companies. What are they doing? Stopping selling boat coverage here. People need to have that boat coverage. My fingerprints won't be on, on taking away boat coverage for people in the state of Minnesota today because I am voting no on this bill. Speaking of insurance, when this bill went off the floor the last time, I talked about the Boats and bites. I had a couple people come up to me after and go, oh, boats and bites, oh, I got it. Well, the bites part of this has to do with provisions in here that say insurance companies, when they have data in the market showing that some animals are more vicious and prone to attacking people than others, can either A, be charged more in premiums, or B, not covered. This provision now in the bill says you can't discriminate against a dog unless you know that that individual dog 
has a history of violent activity. And the part that was really fun after I was done, because I, I must have had some really good comments the last time. So I had people from both sides, my side and the Democrat side, coming up and going, really? I, I didn't know this. When I said a dog only bites once. And I go, whoa. Whoa. I said, yeah. Because once your dog bites, the insurance company is going to cancel you. And you go automatically into the high risk pool. Good luck telling your lender when they say you got to have homeowner's insurance. And you say, I can't afford it. And they're going to go, that is a breach of your mortgage in the state of Minnesota. Because you are required to carry homeowner's insurance on here. And they will go and buy it for you. And they don't shop around like you would. And when you're in the high risk pool, oh, good luck. As my friend Scooby-Doo would say, ruh -roh, you got a problem on your hands. I found it kind of interesting. Since the conference committee met and uh, was going to wrap up the conference committee a week ago Friday, and then we met again on Monday, yet another small child was mauled here in the state of Minnesota by a vicious animal. This session, we were up to three or four instances where vicious dogs have mauled Minnesota residents. But yet, we shouldn't discriminate against the dogs. We know we have these issues. And some have further suggested, wouldn't you rather have them have insurance if that dog is going to bite? And I just say that is another misappropriation of insurance. It's almost like saying, I'm an arsonist, I'm going to burn my own house down because I'm going to be liable to myself. And I've got insurance, and isn't that a good thing because I can move my family somewhere else? That is about the logic that we're blending together with this philosophies in this bill. It's unbelievable what's going to happen to insurance premiums in the state of Minnesota. I'm sure that when I'm done speaking, you're going to hear another flowery explanation from the bill author who's going to say things like, this is a great bill for the people of the state of Minnesota. It takes into account consumers. It takes into account the needs of people. Our colleague, Representative Hugh Brindley, did a great job of spelling out where the, the, what I would call the want, want, want provisions are, stuff that people are kind of in the weeds a little bit on. But I've just outlined where three times insurance premiums are going to go up. Health insurance with the reinsurance program, bites and boats, and now Medicare. What you're going to see, boop, 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 there go premiums. There go premiums for Minnesota payers. Wow. Again, my prints won't be on this bill. There are a lot more things that I could talk about. But I think these are the things that Minnesotans deal with on a daily basis that will affect them, their families, on, a, on an immediate, upfront basis. As Representative Dowd said, and I will echo, I don't want to be the one that said, I told you so. But I've been around these regulated industries in Minnesota for an awful long time. And I've been around this legislature for a long time as well. And when you can start blending those two experiences together, it's pretty easy to start seeing what the future looks like. The last thing I want to end on is something that is just puzzling to me. And that is the right to repair. What could go wrong with that one? You don't have to be an authorized dealer. We're going to force the manufacturers to go ahead and turn over their technology of how to fix those units. As we give little names to different provisions and bills, this one should have been called the no, but I'm willing to learn on your devices about how to repair. Sorry about your voided warranty. Now I know what not to do next time when I get a phone in. And there's nothing in this bill that prohibits somebody from saying and putting a sign out that says, I will service. Notice the carefully chosen words. I will service your iPhone. 
I will service your devices. And they fill in the blank. If they're not, it doesn't say they're an authorized dealer. We will be back soon with a consumer bill of rights. Why? Can you believe what's happening out there? Consumers didn't know when they went in that this person wasn't trained and wasn't authorized to be able to do this. This is an atrocity. Once again, created by this bill. But it won't have my fingerprints on it because I will be voting no. And I encourage every one of the members in this chamber as we're going to hear the wrap-up speeches from the bill author and maybe a few other folks to ask yourself, what am I going to do to my constituents if I vote yes for this bill? And what am I going to do for my constituents if I vote no for, with this bill? I'm pretty sure that the state of Minnesota would be able to get by for one more year without any of these provisions in this bill. And we go back to the drawing board and we actually take into account what Minnesotans are bumping up against. Now I want to just take on my final comment here, a chance to remind you one more time what I shared with you yesterday about what we're seeing, the direction of the state of Minnesota, our business climate, our workforce climate, which the Commerce Department, excuse me, the Commerce Committee is, is, is charged generally with helping to preserve a fair and equitable marketplace for regulated industries. I've oversimplified that. But once again, according to a Chamber of Commerce report, Minnesota ranks 35th in the nation on GDP growth, ranks 40th in job growth, 35th in labor workforce growth, and 42nd in net domestic product. And the news in that report said Minnesota's workforce will probably be roughly the same size in 2030 as it is today in 2023. And as that final generation of baby boomers come of retirement age, we're going to have more people not working than we're going to have working in this country. This bill doesn't address any of those needs. Quite frankly, none of the bills have addressed any of those needs this year, ladies and gentlemen. We know we have areas where we need targeted help, education, law enforcement, teachers. Oh, don't get me started on teachers again. In a positive way. They do a, a lot, and we're asking a lot from them. And I thank them for their job and for their work, as I do the firefighters and the people in the healthcare industry for stepping up and doing what needs to be done. But this bill, nor the other bills, really help you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Again, my fingerprints won't be on this. Please join me with a hands-off approach and vote no on this bill. Thank you, members. Final remarks on the repassage of Senate file number 2744 is amended by conference. I recognize the author, the member from Anoka, Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, uh, members. Uh, thank you, Representative O'Driscoll, for your partnership on the committee this, this year. I enjoy working with you. I appreciate the good working uh, relationship we have. Uh, I was struck a moment ago, you made some, some beeping noises on the floor just a minute ago. And I, I want you to know the good news about this bill is if your technology makes those kinds of beeping noises, you'll be able to fix it yourself. <laughs> Please vote yes. The clerk will take the roll on repassage of Senate file 2744 as amended by conference.
The clerk will close the roll. There being 69 ayes and 59 nays, the bill is repassed as amended by conference and its title agreed to.